Hi, everybody. Welcome to our next AMA with uh, Marshall Johnson of the National Audubon Society. Uh, Marshall, you there? There we go. Chief Conservation Officer at the National Audubon Society. Uh, I've known you since before you picked up that up that extra title. So <laughs> congratulations. It's awesome. It's awesome. Thank Thanks you. For Thank you, Russ. Yeah, great. Hey, um, Hopefully uh, folks are coming on and can start seeing what we're doing and, you know, pop some questions uh, into the comment fields and um, we'll get those in here to the conversation. But while people are doing that, maybe just a little bit of intro. Uh, Marshall, what's your story? How did you get involved in conservation and end up at the Audubon Society? Well, that's a, that's a roundabout story, um, but essentially the the probably most succinct version of it uh, really comes back to the University of Minnesota where I studied. Um, and it was there as a sophomore or junior, I met two friends who were wildlife management uh, majors and you know, they were really passionate about their field and wanting to make the campus more environmental, environmentally uh, sustainable. And it was Eric and Chris, the two uh, classmates and friends that really got me started down the road. Um, but it wasn't until I spent a morning out in uh, prairie chicken blinds out in Northwest uh, Minnesota. And if you've ever, uh, if you've never had the chance to do that, I, I, it's, it's one of those things that really sort of tie your spirit to the land, to the resource, to wildlife. Um, seeing that sort of prehistoric mating ritual out on the prairie. And we were in a pasture, a, um, a pasture in a hay field. And it just sort of, even at a young age, sort of instilled in me the appreciation for working lands um, and how wildlife, particularly birds, uh, can, can cohabitate. So that's sort of junior, senior year of college. I said, I, I, those experiences, those friendships, um, it really gave me a sense that, that there was something in conservation that I needed to explore. And then one thing led to another and then another and then another, I guess after that, exactly. it, 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 that's, that's, that's fun. All right. Conservation ranching. So we're here because Blue Nest Beef is one of your market partners for conservation ranching. We're privileged and honored to be a part of that network. But what the heck is it and what's different about it? Tell us about conservation ranching. Well, the grassland ecosystem is one of the most imperiled ecosystems in all of the Western Hemisphere. Um, that's not an, an overstatement. That's not hyperbole. hyperbole. Uh, we, we've lost roughly 50% or more of the historic grassland ecosystem uh, over the last 100 years. Uh, in some ecoregions, that's 99 plus percent. Uh, the eastern tall grass prairie of Iowa and Minnesota and Missouri um, and, and Illinois and Wisconsin is, is all but gone. Um, and so we, eight or nine years ago, a group of Audubon staff members, really, we, we had sort of gotten tired of um, banging our head against the wall. Uh, and the traditional forms of conservation were not keeping up with what we were seeing year over year uh, in terms of grassland habitat loss. Um, and really what drives this is policy, but even more so than policy, consumer decisions drive um, environmental outcomes uh, as, as it relates to our food sector. And our food sector um, whether it's protein or vegetables, you name it, can be a, an extraordinary force for good or in a, the traditional conventional sense, an extraordinarily um, mm. bad force for the environment. And so we figured if we could, if it's a long shot, it's sort of the, the third rail of environmental conservation, uh, market-based conservation. And we felt like if we could tie uh, positive outcomes for birds to the marketplace um, and, and through the practices that ranchers agree to, then that would be an incredibly new powerful tool 
for grassland conservation. And that's essentially why this is different. Most forms of conservation are, are funded and driven by federal dollars, state dollars, philanthropic dollars. Um, and those are, and that's good. That's, we, we need more of those. Um, but we need the opportunity for the 47 million birders and the millions of other people that care about birds, care about nature, to have more tools in their everyday life to align their lifestyle and their interests with better outcomes for birds. And, and that's what we see the conservation ranching program is doing. Yeah, no, I, I, I love it. Um, I talk all the time about the opportunity for everyday consumers to vote with their fork for the world they want. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, certainly one of the things that attracted um, me into the program, my, my partner's reminding me here that I failed to introduce myself. I'm Russ Concert, co-founder and CEO of Blue Nest Beef. Uh, and like I said, we are one of the market partners here. If you have questions and you're listening, make sure to put them in the chat um, so we can uh, pick them up and, and roll with them there. So let me let me keep going. I don't want to um, dig too deeply on myself. I want to get into specifically what's a what's different here. So if I'm an Audubon conservation rancher, what do I do differently if I'm in your program compared to if I'm not? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when we started out, we brought together some of the leading uh, grassland bird, uh, ornithologists, ecologists, um, managers at a state and federal level. And we, we brought them in with ranchers um, and other scientists. And we developed protocols that based on the best available science we felt would improve outcomes for grassland birds at the ranch level. And so for a rancher enrolling in the program, they're agreeing to adhere to these standards that are broken down uh, into four basic categories, habitat management, forage and feeding, animal health and welfare, and environmental state sustainability. And under those buckets, there are do's and don'ts. There are things that um, we don't want to ever see on a ranch and roll in the, in the program. Um, and, and most ranchers wouldn't want to see, uh, such as the plowing or um, uh, converting of native uh, grasslands to uh, crops or, or any other uh, sort of uh, land use. That's strictly prohibited. Um, the use of neonicotinoid pesticides, strictly prohibited. Um, confined feeding within our program is, is pro prohibited. Uh, so there's a list of things that uh, ranchers are agreeing to um, adhere to uh, by being enrolled in, in the conservation ranching program. And our hope was that by doing that and by creating a habitat management plan, we would get better outcomes for birds. And, and frankly, that's what we're seeing. Hey, I'll just zero in quickly before we go to some of the listener questions here. You said habitat management plan. Can you describe what that is and you know who pulls it together? Yeah, the habitat management plan is the it's the uh, it's the magic, uh, really. It's it's where the protocols meet practical, specific ranch application. Um, and when you tie those things together, you get the habitat management plan. Uh, habitat management plans are created by Audubon uh, range ecologists or other certified uh, Audubon certified um, technicians that go to a ranch work with the ranchers, um, get a feel for the specific operational needs and realities um, on the ground, um, and mesh those with the protocols in a sort of real world application. And that habitat management plan is what is uh, audited by a third party verifier, uh, not the Audubon Society, uh, That that's animal welfare, uh, uh, that, that actually uh, audits the uh, habitat management plan. So that's the living document that exists as the uh, enrollment and and the document which is actually certified uh, by through the program. Yeah, and each and every ranch um, has its own habitat management plan. They certainly learn from each other as they're doing it, but I hope the listeners appreciate what Marshall just described there. The, the, the enormous investment that goes in from the National Audubon Society to have their range ecologists go out there and work with each and every rancher to develop a site-specific 
uh, habitat management program. It's just, it's so unique. All right, so we're getting a bunch of questions coming in now. I'm gonna grab a few from Tucker. Does Audubon quantify bird and wildlife populations before and after ranchers enroll in the program? And what are some of the successes that you've seen? Uh, it's a great question, Tucker. Uh, when a ranch enrolls in the program, uh, pretty quickly, we get out and do baseline monitoring um, using a sort of standardized protocol. And then we will do that monitoring at uh, increments. Uh, first, it's the first two years, and then I believe, depending on where you're, at, where you're located, every other year. And we take that data and we put it into a proprietary um, uh, evaluation uh, system that's been peer reviewed. We call it the bird friendliness uh, index. And the first tranche of ranches that we've uh, that we've analyzed the data for, we're seeing between a 30 and 36 percent increase on average of bird abundance on on Audubon uh, enrolled ranches. I wanna repeat that. Uh, on average, we're seeing almost a third more bird abundance on ranches that are enrolled in the program. We feel really good about this early indicator or barometer of success. And we wanna to continue to work alongside the ranches that are enrolled in the program to continue driving uh, success uh, continue driving um, improvement, but it doesn't work without consumers. And I know we'll talk about that a little bit later, but consumers are the, are the special. If the habitat management plans and the work that goes into managing the ranch, ranches for birds is the magic, the real special sauce and the driver uh, are consumers. So um, we are seeing some really good early returns on, on the program. Yeah, yeah. And that third more birds is just in a fairly short time period so far, too, huh? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, <clears throat> the calibration I always carry around in my mind is that, you know, from that three billion bird study of 53 percent of grassland birds lost in less than 50 years. So if we can get 33 percent, 30 to 36 percent back really quickly, yes. that's 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 just massive. It's so huge. Yeah. Um, Let's see, you work with large ranches. Will there be opportunities for smaller ranches to join the program too? Yeah, it's a great question. Really, um, a lot of it is driven by where we work. Uh, we, we want to and aim to expand into the driftless region and the tall grass region of Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois, um, uh, here at Minnesota uh, moving forward. And, and we, we see that the ranches tend to be a little bit smaller, uh, tend to be um, uh, different different size and, and scale than what we're seeing in Missouri and Montana. Um, and that's just uh, due to the landscape and some other factors. And so as we move into those areas, we will obviously work with ranches that are not 20,000 acres um, or 200,000 acres, the ranches that are maybe 1,200 acres or 600 acres. Uh, so it, it really is driven by um, where we're working and also wanting to get the best bang for our buck. Uh, Audubon funds this program 100% uh, through our traditional philanthropic means. So uh, wanting to make sure that we're being, um, uh, you know, penny, you know, uh, wise with our investments are really is really important as we're still sort of in startup mode. Yeah, yeah, you know, make it a big bang for the buck, Marshall. I think I I, I did that some back of the envelope math just a couple of weeks ago, right? And I discovered that Audubon Conservation Ranching at three and a half million acres already is 60% bigger than Yellowstone National Park. I had to go look up the number, but by focusing on a bunch of acres, I mean, birds aren't like other little things. You can't save a little tiny habitat and solve the problem. They fly, they migrate, they move. And so having lots of acres is actually important too. Absolutely. Um, are we seeing uh, increases in sage grouse populations at any of the participating ranches? We are. Uh, so some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, data that I shared earlier um, comes from ranches that are, are enrolled in Wyoming and other parts of the sagebrush ecosystem. And we're seeing positive uh, results from uh, just about all of our ranches and it varies. Uh, not every ranch is, is uh, producing a third more birds, but 
Um, on average, that's what we're seeing. And that data comes from a wide swath of the 14 states uh, where we have enrolled ranches to date. Cool. Farley has a really good question. Why do we need cattle on grasslands at all? How does grazing help the grassland ecosystem? <laughs> That's a great question. You know, uh, grasslands, uh, I, in, in, I get, I, 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 I'm in discussions like this a lot um, uh, because there's a stigma. There's uh, a lot of uh, really intense conversations around the cow. And we often say it's not the cow, it's the how. Uh, but the reason that you need cattle out on the landscape are uh, a large ruminant uh, of some sort, whether it's bison or elk uh, or you name it. Um, the grassland ecology, the grassland, the history of grasslands uh, evolved with large uh, grazing animals out on the landscape. Their hooves, you know, uh, uh, mesh up and, and disturb the soil and that allows seeds to get that contact back with the soil and the process sort of begins anew. Um, so grazing animals and fire are actually essential to uh, a healthy grassland ecosystem. So there really, uh, there really isn't a grassland ecosystem without large uh, ungulates, large ruminants out on the landscape. Um, it's just they really go hand in hand, and that and that's something that I think is is um, uh, novel for folks that aren't uh, uh, familiar with grassland ecosystem. But they really do go hand in hand, and and so it's not about the cow; it's about how we manage cattle um, for the best benefit uh, for the landscape, for the resource, and for birds. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> I, th I think. Um... The, there was a great article in your Audubon magazine when this thing kicked off about graze like it's 1799, which I thought was fine. But in, in essence, you're trying to mimic the ecological patterns of roaming herds of bison that once formed the grasslands. Um, and it, it's really remarkable to understand how it all works. Um, let's see. Uh, Marla says, are these programs only for ranches? I have an abundance of songbirds and doves in my neighborhood. Well, I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. Uh, and uh, we have so many different programs for uh, different. Uh, we, we like to say at Audubon that we're local everywhere. And that means in mm. a uh, urban environment, we have our bird friendly communities uh, work plants for birds, lights out programs, and other uh, community engagement. So thank you for uh, being a steward in your neighborhood uh, for birds. Uh, this particular program, yes, is uh, only for bison and cattle ranches. Um, Marla, the same person wants to, so her neighborhood appears to be the same as mine. I'm in Texas. So Marla wants to know, is this enrollment available in Texas? It is. We actually have uh, uh, several hundred thousand acres enrolled already in Texas um, across, uh, I want to say, 20 or 30 ranches uh, in Texas alone. And we have an incredible partners down in Texas. Uh, uh, so in, and I grew up half my life in Garland, Texas, so I, I wouldn't have it e any other way. Yeah, yeah. No, it's been really fun to watch um, leading pioneering sustainable regenerative ranchers here in Texas that I know come into the program um, and uh, some are marketing directly and you know some are just getting some other things started but it's just you know I'm, I'm really proud of what Texas has done here. Uh, Doug says how did the grasslands work before there were massive herds of cattle? This kind of relates to your prior question but I think it's a, a good way to frame it and um, maybe you can just dig a little deeper there. Yeah, absolutely. When there weren't, uh, before there were 75, 80 uh, plus million uh, beef cattle out on the land, there were 25 million elk and 60, upwards of 60 million bison uh, moving across this landscape, disturbing the landscape, um, a part of the ecological cycle and renewal of the landscape. Um, and so that that's what existed um, uh, before uh, domesticated cattle were were introduced, um, but they really serve under the right management. 
they really serve a very similar purpose out on the landscape. Uh, the manure serving as fertilizer, natural fertilizer for the grasslands and building soils that um, encourage plant diversity and growth. And that plant diversity and growth in those root systems pull carbon out of the atmosphere. And again, that cycle uh, begins anew. So um, there are a lot of really incredible things going on uh, in the grassland ecosystem, but cattle are bison or elk or you know that ruminant that 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 grazing animal is a vital part of that 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 cycle and i i would share that uh elk uh these large native ruminants also would have produced methane out on the landscape as well so it's uh this has sort of been a part of the system uh long before we were here yeah so let's frame let Let's just kind of flip that a little bit. What would happen if you took all the ruminants off of the grassland landscapes? Well, one is an ecological uh, question, right? One part is ecological. The other part is um, mm. societal um, re uh, reality. Um, a large portion of the remaining grasslands are privately owned. So I think under that scenario, if the animals were removed and the source of income was removed from the landscape, knowing that uh, roughly 90% of what remains is unprotected, um, there would need to be an alternate land use for that land um, moving forward. And we see this every year where we lose about one and a half to three percent of grasslands to, to crop land conversion every year. That's millions of acres in the United States. Think about it uh, like the Amazonian rainforest um, and how much we lose there every year. Our native ecosystem is not maybe a rainforest, but it's native grasslands. Uh, and we lose on any given year actually more acres of native grasslands than the rainforest um, and the Amazon. Um, so just think about that for a second. So, I um, mean, what drives that essentially, if, you know, if I may uh, sort of simplify it, when the cows leave, uh, so do the birds and the grasslands and the bees and the pollinators, uh, because the land typically is converted to some other use. Um, and then again, ecologically speaking, with uh, when the animals are, the grazing animals are gone, whether it's cattle or elk or bison, um, the land doesn't actually rewild, and as we as we think of it, um, these particularly in the central mixed grass and eastern tall grass prairie, it actually becomes really thick with vegetation, and over time that mat of grass chokes out new growth. And to put it simply, the grasslands more or less go dormant, and there yeah. isn't this cycle of life that is natural to the grasslands. It's actually becomes a pretty sad sight. Yeah, one of the things I think a lot of people don't appreciate that any living ecosystem requires that the, the life keep moving within it. And uh, my partner Todd said early on in our journey here, I, I come entirely through the science door into this thing. He said, oh, the carbon got stuck, right? So if the carbon doesn't keep moving through the system, through animals, through grass, and, uh, through, and it's true in any ecosystem, just with different players in that system, the carbon gets stuck, right. the ecosystem dies. So living ecosystems mean that there's carbon moving through it. So um, we, we could probably go in a whole bunch of directions and for an hour, Marshall, but I'm conscious that we're only about five minutes left here. So I want to make sure we get to uh, a couple of things. But what are some of the other benefits of conservation ranching? Are there other benefits beyond um, bird habitat, and if so, what are they, and, and how is Audubon concerned about them? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the conservation ranching program is a vehicle. Um, it's a vehicle for increasing and incentivizing better outcomes for birds. But also, I, I talked about the four pillars of our protocols. One of those pillars uh, is environmental stewardship. And what we do is we work with ranchers to fence out streams and creeks and, and bodies of water so the animals don't have constant uh, access to those areas 
uh, those sensitive environmental areas. And so it's a water quality issue where we're able to increase the quality of the water that's moving through this landscape, moving through the system. Um, some ranches enrolled in the program are, we're helping facilitate uh, prescribed fire, which is again, particularly for the central grasslands, uh, definitely a part of the ecological uh, cycle. Um, and so we're facilitating prescribed fire and that's bringing back more forb component and wildflowers into um, the pastures. That's bringing with it an increase in habitat for declining butterflies and other pollinators and native bees. So whether it's bees and uh, water quality, um, uh, encouraging and enhancing the soil quality on the ranch so it can serve as more of a sponge, a more healthy, um, efficient sponge for carbon out of the atmosphere. There's a myriad of benefits when ranches enroll in the conservation ranching program and reap the benefits from consumers like uh, our, those that are listening uh, to us today. Uh, one, it's, it's really, it can create, and we've seen it create, uh, thanks to partnerships like uh, ours with Blue Nest Beef, a virtuous cycle for the landscape, for the ranchers, um, and for the resource. All right, so let's go there. The consumers, what role do the consumers play in this? Uh, in, in this program, there's a lot of important moving parts, but this program was created for consumers. This program, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of smoke, there's a lot of mirrors, there's a lot of confusion. Um, but Audubon exists for the protection and sustainability of birds, protecting the places that uh, birds need today and tomorrow. Um, and so consumers uh, really drive, they're the, they're the jet fuel, uh, pardon the, uh, the, yeah. the uh, analogy. Like they, they are the jet fuel uh, to this program. We need consumers to make better, consumers who care about birds to make better decisions about the products. This is an old adage uh, certainly, uh, Aldo Leopold wasn't the first to, to share it, uh, but in a 1940 article in the precursor to Audubon, uh, Aldo Leopold laid out this, this sort of uh, idea of choosing uh, producers and the products that they produce, which are better for the environment. And that's what we um, hope the conservation ranching, when you see that seal, that's what it means. Uh, that's awesome. And, and of course, that's what we're here to do is bring it to people. So as we wrap up, we're hitting our 30 minute uh, limit. And I want to respect that for everybody's time here. We told people that we would have a special deal available to everyone tonight if they listened in. And um, it's something we haven't done before, but we are tonight and tonight only until midnight going to offer anyone listening to this broadcast 30% off absolutely everything in our store. So it's a one night flash sale. And Marshall, you have the magic key to unlock that goodie. What is the discount code that our people can use to uh, get access to that 30% discount? Yeah, when you get to your checkout uh, page, all you have to do is put in my name, Marshall2Ls30 and you'll uh, have that discount available. Awesome. Thank you, Marshall. Marshall 30. Uh, thanks, Marshall, for joining us. I know we didn't get to all the questions. There's some goodies in there. We'll pop over to Facebook and YouTube and try to answer what we can that's still hanging there. And uh, check us out at bluenestbeef.com. Check Audubon out. It just go to audubon.org slash ranching to get conservation ranching information. Um, and there you'll find contact information uh, for us, for the people at the National Audubon Society, and they can put you in touch with Audubon professionals in your region if you happen to be a producer that's interested in this. And if you're a consumer, join the flock. All you do is click to buy and we'll get you some great tasting beef that uh, is good for you and good for the planet. So thanks, Marshall. And uh, that's it for tonight. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.